Wednesday afternoon. <laughs> and it's a beautiful day after all that rain. <laughs> and here to hear a uh, conversation about a government that existed when it seems like a, uh, a time passed that nobody can remember, but uh, I think that probably is why uh, people have shown up for the event today. So, uh, so thank you all for, uh, for showing up today. And I want to start off also by, by thanking uh, the person sitting at my right, uh, Rick Enderfirth. Uh, Rick Enderfirth, of course, preceded me as the Wadwani Chair in U.S. India Policy Studies and built up a terrific program. And I, I'm very overjoyed, A, to have a database that brought out fine people like you, but also uh, the, the substantive backing of policy that, uh, that brings people to CSS time and time again, Rick. So thank, thank you so much for your terrific work and leading relationship. We here. should call this the Rick Chair from here on out. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if, any, if there are any Ricks out here, you may be in line after this Rick, so just be thinking about this. Also another very special person in, in, uh, in, for the Wadwani Chair, uh, Ajay Kela, who runs the Wadwani Foundation. Uh, Ajay is the uh, CEO for the foundation and doing terrific work to try to make sure that uh, over the next few years, five million people in India get employed that otherwise wouldn't have. So, uh, so great work and hopefully at the reception, if you haven't met Ajay, you'll be able to do so. Um, so, one more event looking at India's elections. Uh, can I ask who's been to an Indian election event so far in Washington, D.C. this season? <laughs> yeah, looks like about half. I think there's been approximately the same number of events as there are voters in India. So the, uh, the numbers are roughly equal right now so far. <laughs> Um, at this time, though, we're taking a different tact. Instead of looking ahead at what a uh, potential next government of India might look at, what it be its reforms, its policies, its priorities, instead we're going to take a look back. You know, I found this was the, uh, the first event that popped in my mind uh, when, I, when I came and joined the chair. Um, it wasn't that long ago that we last had a BJP government, and it's a very reasonable prospect that we may have a BJP government soon. But conversations about what the BJP is have tended to be painted by what we've seen of them as an opposition party rather than what they'd actually done in practice. So I thought uh, well worth to have a discussion just in case they should happen to win. Um, I think it's worth mentioning that right now, polling data, as good as it is, uh, shows that the, the BJP is expected to win the highest number of seats and therefore be in a, uh, an excellent position to form the next government. But as we were joking about uh, before the event, 10 years ago today, uh, just ahead of the 2004 election, the BJP had won almost the same percent of seats in the same five states and polling data showed them winning 200 seats, which would be up from 182. And the next morning we woke up and Sonia Gandhi was forming the government. So uh, nothing is certain in Indian politics, so take this for what it is. It's a look back and maybe if, uh, if they come back there'll be some points here that you'll find useful. Uh, 1976, Lorne Michaels of Saturday Night Live fame uh, took the closest stab and nearly got the Beatles to get back together on stage for a final performance. He failed. And where he failed, CSIS today has succeeded if the Beatles, <laughs> in your minds, <laughs> are the people that led American foreign policy engagement with India during a critical time of transformation. So uh, very excited to have this panel here today. Uh, you all have their full bios in front, but I'll just mention the, uh, the key roles that everybody played uh, during this transition period. Of course, uh, Ambassador Richard Celeste uh, took over as our ambassador to India uh, just after the BJP came to power and uh, tested nuclear devices. Uh, uh, a job that uh, I can't even imagine uh, stepping into. Uh, Ambassador Rick Enderfirth was our Assistant Secretary of State uh, during the initial stage of when the BJP came to power and uh, led engagement just after this, uh, this uh, interesting early period. Uh, Ray Vickery actually uh, began his work in the federal government at the Department of Commerce as Assistant Secretary for Trade Development and led the Secretary's work on, on, on actually raising uh, trade relations with India just before the BJP's election, but continued to be a private sector leader in increasing American business engagement with India uh, even after leaving the administration, and uh, including our, our good times at India Chem 2000, <laughs> the largest business delegation ever. 43, 43 Rick. companies. 43. And uh, Don Camp, number. who served at the National Security Council, and also after that as a State Department, uh, both throughout the uh, BJP, but also during the transition period. So uh, thanks, everybody, for coming out. And uh, Ambassador Celeste, we'll let you start. Thanks very much. Two disclaimers mm -hmm. right at the beginning. In the first place, the U.S. government's going to work with whoever wins this election and so I no one should take our comments as though we are sitting here wishful thinking about what the outcome is uh, we're reflecting on the past second um, yesterday's BJP is not today's BJP so in some respects it's it's very clear that uh, uh, the BJP has evolved uh, during the past decade or so let me start by being a little more exact about when I arrived in India. I, I arrived in India in November of 1997. 
I handed my credentials to the president of India on the 28th of November in the morning. And that afternoon, uh, I.K. Gujral, the prime minister, handed his letter of resignation to the president <laughs> of India. Uh, had this been the 60s when I first lived in India, Blitz would have headlined, New American Ambassador, Government Falls. <laughs> <laughs> those, those were not related uh, uh, incidents on the 28th of November. But I had arrived with the expectation that we would be planning a visit by President Bill Clinton, scheduled, penciled in for late uh, February of 1998. And of yep. course, when the Gujral government fell, that visit was postponed. Um, I had come out to India so fast that they brought me back for consultations. That happened um, in late uh, April, early May of 1998. There had already been one BJP government, and that government lasted only several months. Uh, and one of the coalition partners, a willful, uh, female leader from South India hmm. decided that she was going to step back and um, as a consequence the coalition government fell and there was a second election. Um, I was in, it, and let me say after that election, uh, one of the prominent issues in the BJP platform which needed to be parsed very carefully was a statement that India was going to exercise its nuclear option. And we weren't sure what that meant. Um, Secretary of Energy, uh, Bill Richardson, came out to India and had an interesting conversation with Jaswant Singh. And for any of you who've ever had an extended conversation with Jaswant Singh, you know that it's a very erudite, articulate, often obfuscation. Obs it's covering up whatever it is that is exactly what he wants to say. In any event, uh, I think Bill Richardson heard that uh, exercising the nuclear option meant considering what was next for India. Uh, we found out what was next while I was sitting in Hawaii when, when the Indian uh, government tested nuclear weapons in May of 1998. And of course, that, uh, that um, triggered both sanctions that were required by virtue of uh, our legislation um, and sanctions that went beyond that by virtue of our irritation. Uh, we, we felt really misled and uh, let down by that decision of the government of India. And so uh, for the next several years, uh, we were engaged in, a, in an interesting conversation uh, between the United States government and the government of India. Um, I think that uh, Rick Indefirth uh, can talk more about the uh, uh, dialogue between uh, Jaswant Singh and Strobe Talbot that uh, continued over that period of time. Uh, I carried bags in and out of that meeting. He was much more directly involved. <laughs> but the interesting thing is that it, it really represented the most sustained high-level diplomatic exchange in the history of India as an independent country and the United States as a partner. And in that discussion, though, I don't feel that we believe that India had moved very far. Um, relationships um, were formed that served us well in uh, the months that followed. Also, during this time, other things happened. I mean, do you remember something called Y2K? <laughs> now, the BJP can't claim credit for Y2K. Those two things aren't related. But Y2K uh, became an incredible um, driver of the, of the economic relationship between our two countries. It opened up a whole new perspective on the part of American business leaders as to the capability of Indian businesses. And it presented uh, the BJP government, which was committed to uh, a forward-looking economic policy and committed to strong ties with the Indian diaspora in the United States. It, it uh, created an opportunity for sustained conversation, even at a time when sanctions were enforced between our, our two nations. And then, of course, there was uh, the incursion into Cargill, which occurred. Cargill was important because 
it represented in, uh, first a blow to uh, the efforts on the part of the government of India to move forward in dialogue with Pakistan. I mean, the Indian Prime Minister had made a trip to, uh, uh, to Pakistan in an effort to promote uh, dialogue. Um, it represented the first time really when the United States had to make a clear choice between India and Pakistan and we, we chose India because the facts were with India and because as we counseled the BJD government to restrain itself and not cross the line of control, something that many of our own military people thought would be essential to drive the Pakistani forces who were up in these very high uh, outposts in Kargil, thought it would be necessary to uh, go after the logistical lines that supported them. Um, the government of India showed restraint and all of that, I think, uh, uh, set a, a stage for when Prime Minister Nawaz Sharif came to, to uh, Washington on the 4th of July, um, uh, hoping to uh, secure some kind of, I think, face-saving help from uh, the Clinton administration. And Bill Clinton says, you've got to withdraw, period, full stop. That's the only thing that will satisfy us. Um, and then, of course, uh, not too long thereafter, and uh, Bill Clinton came to visit India. Now, the only mission I had when I went to India, the, the, re the one that really counted, was a mission that had been given to me personally by Hillary Clinton before I was confirmed. We were at a Habitat build in Kentucky, and she grabbed me by the arm, and she said, Dick, there's one thing you have to do when you go out to India as ambassador, and that is get Bill out there to see him. <laughs> Those of you who have been exposed to that kind of direct <laughs> mandate <laughs> from the First Lady know that you will do whatever you need to do. So I did some things which won't appear in any history books and won't be divulged here, but <laughs> <laughs> tried to point out that, to President Clinton that the, if he was going to visit India and if it were to be a productive visit, then he had to come not later than uh, March of, of, uh, of uh, the year 2000. And that visit, which was the first by a presidential visit in 22 years or more, uh, lasted five days. It was a stunning success. It was a sharp contrast to his brief few hours in Pakistan. All of this a powerful message to uh, the government of India. So from all of this, how, how, would I, how would I describe what it was like to work with the BJP? Well, first, uh, the BJP is a proud party. It is a nationalist party and it's devoted to what it believes is uh, in the national interest for India. It's not apologetic about that. And it never apologized for making a decision to test nuclear weapons. It's a proud party. It continues to be a proud party. Secondly, uh, it believes in a strong India able to protect itself. In spite of its desire for friendly relationships with neighbors and with the United States, first and foremost, I, I think that it, it sees India as, a, as, a, you know, as one of the great powers, coming great powers of this world, and uh, wants to act accordingly, whether it's in uh, the world of diplomacy or military strategy or whatever. The third is it, that in terms of domestic uh, policy, it is progressive from a pro-business standpoint. In other words, I think, ironically, for all of the criticism of the Congress Party and Congress Party reform initiatives from the outside, once the BJP's in power, it does almost exactly the same thing. And if you look at issue after issue, you'll find that there's much more continuity, I think, in this front than elsewhere. Um, and, uh, Interestingly, one of, one of the key players in all of this time, and I'll mention this and others might come back to it, of course, was Jaswan Singh. I spent a great deal of time with him, uh, usually late in the afternoon at his home over liquid refreshment of some kind or another. Um, no note takers. I don't know whether he kept a journal. I didn't keep a journal. But I, I, w I would say in many respects he embodied those qualities of um, what I've described as the BJP. Proud, strong, progressive. Um, that's the way he thought. And um, it was interesting, he was the first cabinet member 
to want to put the information technology into his cabinet office mm -hmm. because he had been he supported the early development of NIC of the uh, that infrastructure network, uh, and it's not. Therefore, I, I, I say this because, as you all know, he is not running as a member of the BJP, though his son is a member of the BJP and a member of the legislature in Rajasthan. He's running as an independent. Um, the last thing I would say is that uh, I found the BJP leadership uh, uh, to be uh, pro-Western in their outlook. They, they wanted a positive relationship with the United States. That was important. They wanted a positive uh, relationship with uh, uh, the European leadership as well. Um, so back to my disclaimer, okay? The United States government's gonna work with whomever the people of India and their wisdom choose. And as a former politician, I wanna underscore something Rick said. I don't care what the polls say, you know. Uh, you can't always win an election, but I learned this, you can always lose an election. And mm -hmm. you never quite know what's going on when there are 80 to 100 million new voters casting their votes for the first time in India. Now, secondly, um, uh, you know, my affection for the leadership of, of the BJP, for Prime Minister Vajpayee, for the Home Minister, Mr. Dabani, and for Jaswant Singh, who was one minister after another in their government, um, my respect and affection is considerable, but they're not calling us idiots in the party today. Uh, Rick? Well, uh, it's very hard to follow Dick Celeste. Um, <laughs> he, he was our on the ground uh, ambassador. Uh, he knows these people so well, so come back to him with your questions. <laughs> he's, got, he's got a lot more to tell you. Rick, thanks for bringing this group together. Um, I don't know, for the Beatles, um, <laughs> some of us were humming the way we were as we came into the, uh, into the auditorium. Um, it is a great idea to try to um, forecast what the next BJP-led government will do based on the experience of the last one, assuming that, as I think everyone in this room does, that uh, Mr. Modi is positioned to take um, charge. But um, in two weeks, we'll know. And it may not be what we're thinking now. So don't, don't bet the ranch on it, but uh, you know, maybe the some part of it. Um, <laughs> I want to pick up on some of the things that, uh, that Dick had to say. L let me underscore one thing. Those individuals within the BJP that we dealt with, uh, this is a new BJP that's coming. It's a generational change taking place. Um, Rajesh Mishra is no longer with us. Uh, Mr. Vajpai is still here, but not active. Uh, Jaswant Singh has been expelled not once but twice from the BJP party, now running as an independent. Um, Mr. Advani is no longer in charge. Uh, so those that preceded the next BJP government, uh, I'm sure will be influenced by, be well aware of what its predecessor did, but there is a generational change taking place. So I think that we do have to take that into account. Um, what I'd like to do is to uh, go back to that moment that we will never forget, uh, those of us in government, May 28th, 1998, um, when uh, India exercised its nuclear option. <laughs> um, I do that because it is an issue that is not just in the past, and I'm going to get to this in a moment. It is still with us today, and I'm, I'll tell you why. By the way, I'm, I'm and I see Persis Kumbata here, my former colleague here, and at the Elliott School, I've returned to the faculty at George Washington University. So I'll be speaking not only as a former official, but as a professor again. So I have brought uh, reading assignments for you all. <laughs> so I will let you know what you will need to read after this. Mm. So I'll just go ahead and uh, forewarn you of the reading assignments. Um, the first one does have to do with, with what Dick referred to, and that is Strobe Talbot's book, Engaging India, Diplomacy, Democracy, and the Bomb. It is a wonderful account of the Talbot-Singh or Singh-Talbot dialogue that went over two years. Uh, didn't get everything that we had hoped 
in terms of the specifics nailed down, far from it, but in terms of establishing a rapport with India at the highest level over a sustained period of time, it did lay the groundwork for much what much that has happened since then in terms of the improvement and the strengthening of the U.S.-India relationship. I will tell you on that day um, of May 28th, it probably was my worst day at the State Department. We had convened, Don, were you there? I was in your office, it was May 11th actually. Mm -hmm. I'm yeah. sorry, May 11th, <laughs> May 11th. Uh, yes, I remember. <laughs> thank you. I guess I tried to blot it out exactly what day it was. Um, on May 11th. You and I were in Pakistan on May 28th, I think. That's, that's right, okay. Uh, we did try to go to convince Prime Minister Nawaz Sharif not to follow suit. That was a mission impossible, mm -hmm. uh, understandably so. May 11th, thank you, Don. Uh, in my office, and my special assistant walked in my office, we were having a senior staff meeting, and she said that uh, CNN was reporting that India had just undertaken a series of underground nuclear tests, CNN, and I said, did, did you say CNN, or you mean CIA? She said, no, CNN. Mm -hmm. I said, let's call the embassy. <laughs> and we called, and I and think I wasn't there. you weren't there. Ashley Wills was, had been called into the foreign ministry. So, now, that was a low point. Um, it was not that great that I then had to go up to Strobe Talbot's uh, deputies uh, uh, meeting uh, that he would chair for Madeleine Albright, and I, everyone wanted to see me for some reason on that day. They wanted to hear what was taking place. But from that came an extraordinary beginning transformation in the relationship. Uh, and Strobe Talbot's account uh, is a very good look, not only into the diplomacy of it, but the politics of it. So that's the first reading assignment. The second one is uh, this one, which I do hope that you have read through. <laughs> this is the manifesto, the BJP manifesto. Dick has already mentioned that the manifesto then included a reference to inducting nuclear weapons into India's arsenal. And there was a question, what, what is inducting? What does that verb mean? Various interpretations. Well, we found out soon afterwards what induction meant. And now to read this document, uh, it's a 40 page document. And if you turn to page 39, um, there is a reference here. Interestingly, foreign policy and security policy are the last two pages mm -hmm. of this. That may send a signal of you know, where priorities are. First is at home, second is abroad. But if you read this, there is a section on the independent strategic nuclear program, and it says that the new government, BJP, would be, its emphasis would be on beginning a new thrust on framing policies, and would look in detail uh, to revise and update India's nuclear doctrine. To revise and update India's nuclear doctrine. Well, that set um, the New York Times off. It did immediately an article, what does that mean? Uh, let's figure out what these words mean. And the quick assumption by many analysts was that India would look again at its no first use policy of nuclear weapons. Fortunately, um, within days, uh, Narendra Modi said India is not going to revise its no first use policy. That you know, caused a sigh of relief among many watching. But you do need to read this document. Uh, Ray is going to get to the economic dimensions of uh, India under the BJP and where it may be heading. But the international relations, foreign affairs, relations with neighbors, uh, there's a reference, for instance, in terms of internal security, zero tolerance, zero tolerance for uh, terrorism. Uh, and I think every country, I mean, what are you going to have, 1% tolerance, 2%? No, of course, <laughs> countries have zero tolerance. <laughs> Pretty groundbreaking stuff. <laughs> Pretty groundbreaking. But what you do want to see is <coughs> also a question of not having zero restraint, because restraint must be exercised in terms of attacks which will come Mumbai, exam examples, uh, will come. So zero tolerance, yes, but there will also need to be restraint in how to respond. So uh, that whole nuclear uh, issue that we dealt with is still one that 
is alive, important for both countries and for the world. Uh, so do read this manifesto. The third document that I want to recommend is this one. It's much shorter, it's only about three pages. The Lahore Declaration. Uh, Dick referred to the fact that Prime Minister Vajpayee traveled to Pakistan um, to meet with Prime Minister, then Prime Minister, and today's Prime Minister, Nawaz Sharif. I'm going to underscore something here because I spend a lot of time on this. Um, the importance of a breakthrough in the India-Pakistan relationship uh, was underscored at the time of the Lahore Declaration. This was, it was called bus diplomacy. Uh, Prime Minister Vajpayee went across the Wagga border on a bus. Nawaz Sharif was there to welcome him. Um, it was a extraordinarily important uh, event. The declaration, uh, the work plan that was laid out. Uh, Prime Minister Vajpayee went to the Minari Pakistan, first time an Indian Prime Minister had done that, a signal that India accepted Pakistan as a state, not calling into question all of that history. Uh, and Nawaz Sharif demonstrated with that visit that he could be a willing partner in a peace process. So fast forward, not, actually not fast forward, it got derailed in Cargill. I won't go to Cargill right now, but having been at Blair House when Nawaz Sharif was here for that, I think he enjoyed himself more in Lahore than he did that day in Washington on July 4th. Um, that got derailed. And even though Prime Minister Manmohan Singh has said that he wanted to go to Pakistan during his time in office, he never got there. Um, I think that the possibility of a new government, BJP-led, uh, with Mr. Modi uh, can return to the spirit of Lahore. I think this is eminently doable and would answer questions on both sides. Clearly there are questions about Mr. Modi and his relationship to the Muslim community. Reaching out to um, Nawaz Sharif, traveling to Pakistan, uh, rekindling the spirit of Lahore, I think is something that is within reach. Some have said that if Modi takes that kind of step, it'll be like Nixon going to China. Great, that was a great success, changed the world. So I think this is something that um, uh, could be done, and I think this could also be the opportunity for Prime Minister Nawaz Sharif to do what I think is fully teed up and is ready to go, and that is most favored nation trading status. You have that kind of burst of activity at the beginning. Uh, this could be seriously a game changer for them. My final comment would be that they could also, with that, there are other issues that will flow from that, one of which is one that I've been personally involved in of late, which is Afghanistan. I was to have been in Afghanistan for the uh, recent elections. Unfortunately, our NDI, National Democratic Institute, uh, mission had to be canceled because of what was taking place with attacks. Um, had been there in December for a pre-election assessment. There will be a new leader of Afghanistan, um, whether it be Abdullah Abdullah or Ashraf Ghani, we'll see. Uh, this is also going to provide opportunities, and this is an opportunity that India and Pakistan need to seize right now. Uh, they can't be timid. If there's going to be any kind of peace in Afghanistan, it's going to require some degree of cooperation, accommodation between India and Pakistan. Again, I think Mr. Modi and a new government uh, has that opportunity. I think Nawaz Sharif wants to have relations with Afghanistan that they have not been able to have with Mr. Karzai for a whole host of reasons. So I'm very hopeful that over the next several weeks, we're going to see possibilities for moving ahead with the new um, with the new government, and one that, if it is Mr. Modi, if it is a BJP, can draw on the kind of outreach that uh, Atal Bihari Vajpayee, Jaswant Singh, Rajesh Mishra, and others demonstrated during our time when we were in office. I'll end okay, there. Thank you. Thank you. Ray, looking at the, uh, the business side of things here. Well, um, I feel a little bit uh, in this position after coming 
after such eminent speakers uh, like Governor Huey Long uh, did when he came home dead drunk one night uh, in Louisiana and he was trying to get in the, uh, the door and his key wouldn't work and all of a sudden the door opened and he fell down on the floor and he looked up and his wife was looking him straight in the eye and said, now Governor, what do you have to say for yourself? said, well, I finished my prepared remarks. I'll take questions from the floor. <laughs> 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 Maybe we just ought to open it up. I, I do have a few memories that I'd like to, to pass on. I had just left the Department of Commerce when the BJP uh, uh, came into power. Uh, rather than go back to, uh, to the practice of law, I was so interested in uh, U.S.-India relations, I decided I'd hang my uh, shingle out. Well. Uh, I hadn't read the manifesto closely enough about inducting the nuclear option because no sooner had I hung it out than the bombs went off and nobody was interested <laughs> in doing anything uh, with India at that time. Fortunately, the good people at the uh, U.S. India Business Council, including Rick Rosso and Michael Clark, uh, took pity on me and uh, they let me uh, work with them. And we did go to work uh, immediately on the sanctions question. And one of the things that uh, I learned quite quickly, I think, from uh, working uh, on that uh, sanctions issue from the point of view of legislative action was that the BJP government was very sophisticated about how to deal with Congress, about how to deal uh, with Americans, uh, and a lot of the image that you had of BJP as people who uh, didn't speak English and wanted to only talk about uh, religion just was not so. Uh, they were very much uh, attuned to economic issues. Um, uh, immediately they saw that there were members of the Senate who had uh, economic interests. Uh, particularly Senator Brownback from Kansas, um, who was exporting engine, airplane engine parts, as well as uh, wheat from Kansas. Uh, he was the chairman of the subcommittee, and immediately there was a very, um, there was a lot of movement in the whole, and the kinds of statements that had come from the president and the White House initially about how this was going to be uh, great retaliation got very much vitiated because of the sophistication of the B BJP leadership. And so I think that um, in spite of what you hear that there is a lot and this is a new generation, but I think it can make a, a, a great difference. Um, I have uh, in my portfolio U.S.-India economic relations, and I'm working right now on a book having to do with uh, India energy and the struggle for power. Uh, and in going uh, through uh, research papers um, uh, having to do with the background uh, and looking at the president's trip in 2000, I was looking at ta uh, papers that came out from the BJP administration at that time. Uh, and uh, I thought that this statement was, uh, was very interesting. Uh, this is called Emerging Opportunities in the Oil and Gas Sector. Uh, and I want you to think about this in the context of what the present government might say in that regard. The government of India has taken a conscious decision to gradually reduce the size of the public sector by withdrawing from slash divesting its shareholdings in many areas, thereby throwing open these hitherto protected sectors to privatization. Now that's a word you haven't heard uh, in a long time uh, from an Indian government. Opening up the economy by progressive dismantling of the licensing and regulatory regimes, liberalization of procedures and policies, drive towards market determination of prices by the working of demand supply forces are characteristics of the new era. Now, that is something uh, you just wouldn't hear. And in the manifesto, there is not that kind of statement, but there are reflections of getting away from the top-down command economy, which I'm afraid that this uh, uh, second term of the present government has slipped back toward, rather than uh, wealth creation of wealth distribution. 
So I think in that regard, uh, there is hope. Uh, and if you look at particularly, just take the energy area, uh, it was the BJP who put in the new exploration and licensing policy, which for the first time opened up oil and gas, uh, did away with the administered pricing mechanism uh, and in production supply contracts, actually use market pricing kinds of, um, of language in it. Now, there has been uh, retrogression uh, from that. Now, of course, uh, you have to take all of that with a grain of salt when you look at the manifesto that says we're against investment uh, in multi-brand retailing. We're not going to allow that. On the other hand, uh, when uh, I was last in Gujarat and uh, we were talking about solar energy, uh, the idea of having uh, local content restrictions was done away with. The folks uh, in Gujarat said, look, we don't really care if it comes from the U.S. What we want to do is get solar power in here. So I think that uh, if you look at the track record of what happened with the, um, in the energy sector, uh, there is uh, some uh, indication that you're going to get back on track some of the kinds of reforms which were instituted ironically by a Congress-led government uh, in the early 90s. I'll give you another indication of that. In 2003, under uh, the leadership of a man who Rick and I worked with uh, very closely when uh, he was uh, first the Minister of uh, Chemicals and Fertilizers, Suresh Prabhu, he became uh, uh, the Minister of Power. And the greatest reform ever made in the energy sector uh, was made under that government, namely the Electricity Act of, of 2003. Now that was the good news. The bad news was that Minister Prabhu was then fired for being too honest. Uh, he was not, and there was no, there was no uh, um, going around that. That's, uh, that was, that's, that's what had, had happened, and it indicates to me uh, the uh, constraints that there will be on uh, any uh, BJP-led government by coalition partners, because it's not going to necessarily be uh, the people at the top who are calling the shots in regard to who can stay in power. Uh, I'll give you another example. Um, one of the things that uh, Rick and I worked on, and uh, uh, we were out in, uh, uh, in uh, Seattle for uh, 1999, uh, uh, WTO ministerial. People dressed as turtles is the only thing I remember from that. <laughs> People dressed as turtles. <laughs> Your mic's on? No. Excuse me? Huh? People in the back are sad they can't hear they it well. Can't hear yeah. It. Oh, I'm sorry. We're getting protest on the uh, Twitter feed. <laughs> That's going to help it. There you go. Uh, Pick up with the turtles. Okay. And Minister. Uh, <laughs> Uh, Marin at that time, Mercilly Marin was the uh, Minister of, uh, of Commerce and Industry. Uh, and I thought we'd had pretty good talks about what was going to happen and being able to go for in trade liberalization. Well, when we got there, Mr. Marin, uh, who is, as you know, DMK and very much a part of the coalition at that time, uh, he had other ideas. And what he had in mind was that uh, no way, no how, are we going to go along with uh, any of the program that was being advocated by the United States government. And that continued over into the Doha round uh, in 2001. Now, if you had talked with Jaswan Singh, as I'm sure y uh, you may have mentioned, uh, Ambassador, in one of these um, refreshment 
fuel conversations of uh, I'm sure that he would have been been very uh, willing to say yes, we're willing to compromise and so forth. But it wasn't, in fact, the BJP government that was calling the shots completely in regard to WTO. It was another member of the coalition who did that. So it seems to me that that is uh, is a cautionary uh, kind of uh, of uh, warning that we we need to take into account. Uh, I, just to sum up, uh, I think that, um, that uh, this election itself is hopeful. Uh, thanks to Rick, uh, published a piece that uh, I wrote in um, more than a year ago about this election, in which I made the argument uh, that things were in uh, a state of stalemate, really. Uh, and from what we have seen, it seems to me that either way this goes, uh, that we should have some impetus and some window of opportunity to move forward on the economic front. And the economic front, uh, in my view, will be a driver in terms of the relationship between the United States and India. Perfect, great, thanks, Ray. Well, Don, a long tenure at two different perches, National Security Council and over at State Department, so uh, please. Uh, well, thank you. I, I'm, uh, Ray, I'm like Huey Long, I do have my prepared remarks. So um, <laughs> let me just begin by saying that I, I, there was, in my view, a confluence of factors on the U.S. and Indian side that made the BJP government a good one for strengthening uh, U.S.-India relations during its six-year term. But as they say in a stock prospectus, past performance is no guarantee of future results. And a great deal of that progress was driven by personalities, and that, those are personalities that are no longer on the scene, or at least are not likely to be prominent in an upcoming BJP-led coalition. But it is encouraging to remember how fast the relationship progressed from its nadir in May 1998, uh, the nuclear test, to Bill Clinton's rock star reception in Delhi in March 2000. That's some reassurance today as we confront the aftermath of Devyani Kobragade and IPR and other differences. Now, my fellow panelists have dealt pretty, covered in very in detail the Clinton administration's dealing with the Vajpayee-led government. Let me pick up, therefore, with the arrival of the Bush crowd. One thing I remember from the U.S. election period is the strong and ill-disguised support in Delhi policy circles for a victory by Al Gore. There was a sense that India and the U.S. had turned an important corner during the Clinton administration and that Gore would carry that progress forward. This was despite Bush's efforts under the tutelage of Condi Rice and Bob Blackwell, two of his Vulcans, to make the case that India policy would be a high priority in a Bush administration. And as we all saw, the Bush administration did carry the relationship to new heights. From the U.S. perspective, from the Washington perspective, I should say, we were dealing with three Indian leaders who had rather unique strengths. Atul Bihari Vajpayee, seemed to us to delegate a lot of the details to his staff, but was strongly committed to better relations with the U.S. Part of it may have been simply a reaction to the Congress policies of the past, but remember, he was the author of that quote about natural allies, which may be the last time that an Indian leader had the temerity to talk about an ally, the word ally in respect to the United States. Uh, Jaswant Singh, began the long process of improved relations uh, in his intense dial dialogue with Strobe Talbot. His memoirs, like Strobe's, eloquently describe his efforts to move the relationship forward. And I saw an article he published just a few days ago, uh, India Must Move Beyond Non-Alignment, which testifies to his willingness to look forward, not back. But after the, his expulsion from the uh, party earlier this year, it does not look like a Modi government would tap his skills. although. Stranger things have happened in Delhi, yeah. so we can hope. Uh, Brajesh Mishra was in a new position as National Security Advisor, had great access to Vajpayee, and was also the counterpart to Condi Rice, who was the most effective cheerleader in the Bush administration for better ties with India. Uh, Vajpayee, by most accounts, gave Mishra a lot of leeway in pursuing India's security policies, and he used it in dealing with the United States. Let me talk about three decisions by the, by the Vajpayee government toward the U.S. that surprised me at the time. It surprised me because I had been watching U.S.-India relations for a long time, 
And I thought I could anticipate sort of establishment India's response to most major US foreign policy decisions. The BJP, however, did not act like establishment India, and it did not adhere to NAM orthodoxy. The first decision involved George Bush's very controversial speech on May 1st, 2001, early in his presidency, announcing his plans to develop missile defenses and his willingness to contemplate withdrawing from the uh, ABM treaty. This was greeted with something resembling shock by much of the world. Our al allies were at best tentative and some quite negative. The reflexive India res Indian response would have come from the traditional disarmament manual. Instead, India was, I believe, the first or one of the first to support that idea within 24 hours of the speech. Nothing, nothing could have endeared India to the Bush administration at that stage more than that public support, which of course owed a fair amount to India's own role outside the <coughs> nuclear establishment. Let me read just part of the MEA statement issued within hours of the Bush speech. President Bush's address is a highly significant and far-reaching statement of US national security policy. It seeks to transform the parameters on which the Cold War security architecture was built. India particularly welcomes the announcement of unilateral nuclear reductions by the US. We also welcome moving away from the hair trigger alerts associated with prevailing nuclear orthodoxies. I, my guess is that was written by Jaswant Singh. It sounds like it. Hmm. Now it is true that Condi Rice had called Mishra the night before to give him a heads up on the speech and offered to send Rich Armitage out to Delhi as part of his world tour explaining the president's plan. But Vajpayee Singh and Mishra did not hesitate to take a rather heterodox view and they took flack from India's chattering classes for that stance. Um, the second decision actually surprised me less because it came in the immediate wake of 9-11. India, like virtually everyone else, had rushed to our side and offered assistance. Our proposal to India was a precedent setting one to help provide security for US Navy ships transiting the Malacca Straits. India up to that point had only participated in UN sanctioned multinational uh, operations. And as Raja Mohan put it, writing about it later, quote, much of the civilian bureaucracy was aghast at the prospect of India being seen as serving America's security interests. But the Vajpayee government bucked the naysayers and sent two Navy ships to help protect US uh, ships from terrorist attack over a long period of time. And that whole terrorism issue was highlighted, I would say, as a common threat uh, when, of course, India's parliament was attacked on December 13, 2001. Bob Blackwell went to the, the scene, went to the Lok Sabha a day later, and famously labeled it India's 9-11. Um, the third indication that the Vajpayee government wanted to take a different approach to the United States was the coming of the Iraq War. India, like much of the world, took a very dim view of the US acting without a Security Council mandate. And when it was clear that the US did intend to invade, the press, public, and political reaction was strong and intensely critical. Uh, when Vajpayee had been in Washington in September 2002, as things were beginning to heat up on Iraq, Rice had had a side meeting with Mishra and urged him to hold your fire on criticizing the US and Iraq. And he told her that India would not lead the charge. And overall, he kept that commitment. The government statements in 2003 were critical, but they did not lead the charge. They tried very hard to take a middle ground, supporting our objectives, but deploring the lack of legal cover from the UN. The Congress party at that time introduced a resolution in the Lok Sabha condemning the US invasion. The BJP countered with a weaker one, which still deplored it. But the story doesn't end there. In May and June of that year, the US put on a full court press to get other countries to contri contribute to a multinational Iraq stabilization force with the aim of making the effort there more of, of an international one. If I'd been asked at that time, and I probably was, I would have said, don't bother with Delhi. There's no government there would contemplate sending troops to Iraq without a UN mandate. In fact, we did ask them. And Singh and Mishra did, by most accounts, give it very serious thought. We proposed making Kurdistan the Indian area of responsibility, and Delhi sent officials to Kurdistan to check it out. The Cabinet Committee on Security consulted on the issue and deferred a decision. It became an issue in the Indian press, which was strenuously opposed. Advani discussed it in Washington with the President, and by July, the Cabinet Committee on Security finally took a decision that it could not send troops without a Security Council man a resolution. But my point is they did not reflexively dismiss the idea they rather took the US request very seriously and tried hard to accommodate us. 
why did the BJP government take a, a, this approach, to, a new approach, I would say, to the U.S. on all these issues? And what did they think was in it for them? First, I give a lot of credit to the previous administration. President Clinton's doggedness in pursuing Nawaz Sharif over Cargill demonstrated that U.S. goals in South Asia could coincide rather than conflict with India's interests. The Clinton visit to India and his tone-perfect speech to the Lok Sabha mm -hmm. and his tough talk to Pakistan five days later reinforced that feeling. And I also believe that they saw the potential early on for a substantial payoff from the Bush administration. Mishra and Rumsfeld met in Munich within uh, the first month of the administration, and Jaswant Singh came to Washington and the White House in April of that year. Bob Blackwell arrived in Delhi in July and began a dialogue with Mishra by October on the trinity of cooperation with the U.S., nuclear space and high-tech cooperation. And very soon, Bob Blackwell was papering the airwaves with his enthusiastic advocacy, ca advocacy cables to, to, to Washington. Um, now, Bob Blackwell has yet to write his memoirs, but I'm sure he presaged a future with Mishra of, that included U.S. acceptance of India's nuclear program. The State Department was, at that stage, not quite ready for this. Under Secretary John Bolton, in particular, was an ardent defender of the non-pro treaty and held off any substantial progress. We finally started negotiations on nuclear space and high tech in 2003, and of course, concluded the nuclear deal in 2005, after the BJP had left office. But Vajpai Singh and Mishra saw this coming, and they responded in kind. Um, now let me conclude by just saying, what we now see in both India and the United States is a common perspective that both countries have shared interests, shared values, and I think sufficient to make us confident of the future despite the problems we encounter along the way. In the U.S., we've had three presidents in a row now promoting the importance of U.S.-India relations. And in India, we've had two governments from both the BJP and Congress who share the same approach. Narendra Modi is a mystery in this and other respects and the revocation of his visa in 2005 both complicates the situation and adds to the puzzle. Any hurt feelings aside, however, I am reasonably confident that Modi's inevitable push for Indian economic and infrastructure development will draw him, him inevitably toward nurturing the relationship with the United States, and I am very, very confident that, as Dick says, this administration, any administration, will be happy to work with a Modi government if that's what we have in the future. Great. Thank you. Thanks, Byron. Thanks, Byron. Well, before I open it up, I, I just thought I would uh, ask a couple of questions as well. Uh, but first, a couple of things I'll mention. Uh, uh, Professor Inderfirth uh, talked about the manifesto. Uh, hopefully, he'll plug his ears for this. Uh, if anybody wants the Cliff's Notes version, uh, we just put out on the CSIS website a, uh, a short uh, summary of uh, how the uh, Congress and BJP and also the regional parties treat uh, some, of the, some of the key issues on FDI and trade and things like that. So uh, certainly not as robust as the full version, but if you want the Cliff's Notes, uh, check the uh, CSIS website. Uh, also, you know, the rest Ray of us thank you for that. <laughs> <laughs> also, Ray talking about the, uh, the lobbying work that was done after the nuclear tests. Uh, one, one, one other difference that we'll have between then and now, I don't know why this popped into my head, but uh, the number one company that was uh, there in, in the front row on that, because of course USIBC, we were working hard on it, was a little company called Enron. So uh, if, uh, if there is another nuclear test and sanctions, we're going to lose the stalwart that, uh, that worked uh, as hardest among equals in, uh, in getting those sanctions rolled back. So uh, you know, that's one small instance where I think we can all say we miss Enron just a little bit. <laughs> um, now, uh, looking uh, more strategically, I think everybody would agree that you know, there was. Could I add an Enron story? Yeah, always, <laughs> always. <laughs> when you're appointed to positions and you have to go through Senate confirmation, you have to fill out financial disclosure forms. And so I filled out mine, my wife's. We had um, you know, our portfolio and the rest. They came back saying that I had to divest myself <laughs> of one stock to be Assistant Secretary of State for South Asia, Enron. <laughs> thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs> I may be the only nominee to ever thank the process <laughs> for getting me out ahead of something that then collapsed. So The best investment advice uh, ever <laughs> it received. It was wonderful. Um, so, uh, so a real coming together that took place uh, the last time that, that the BJP was, was in power. Um, I, I wonder if you can each touch on uh, what was it that drove them to make that decision? I mean, I think at the time we still looked at you know, the inclusion of the hyphen, India, Pakistan, and, and certainly as it was referenced, the fact that uh, you know, we finally um, really kind of broke the hyphen by choosing India's side and Cargill. 
but, uh, but, but the BJP's driving force. I mean, was it breaking the hype and with Pakistan? Was it that they viewed China as a strategic competitor? Uh, what were the kind of forces that you think that really were, were behind them, uh, pushing them, uh, you know, a bit, bit more in our direction than we've seen in the past? You're looking at me. Um, you, you have well, those, you know, uh, I, 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 don't, I, I really don't <laughs> know what was in, in, inside their heads at the time, although I, I, I believe, you know, if, if you wanted to, to distinguish yourself from the Congress party, being more favorably inclined toward the United States <laughs> yeah. was one easy way to do it because uh, we had had such a problematic uh, series of issues vis-a-vis -vis Congress going back to I mean, I remember in the 1960s uh, when I was there the first time, I mean, um, and, and shortly thereafter, Mrs. Gandhi throwing the Peace Corps out. I mean, they, they, you know, we had, we had a, a troubled history. I think that they're, they're first place, they, they, they are, the BJP was a more confident party about India and its future. They had a sense of its place in history, and I think this made them less defensive mm. in their sort of architecture of foreign policy. Uh, they were willing to, to join in a vigorous debate. We saw this repeatedly with John Swanson and Strobe. And they, so they didn't, they were, there wasn't a kind of defensiveness about, about India's posture. Um, I, but I don't know, I mean, let me, I'm gonna tell a story which is not recorded, I think, anywhere, although Condoleezza Rice may have, the, uh, may have uh, written about it. I, I accompanied Jaswant Singh to Washington in, in uh, his visit in early April of uh, the year 2001. Uh, Colin Pollard asked me to stay on. And we, we met with all of the senior officials and while we were in the cabinet room meeting with Condoleezza Rice, there was a scheduled walkthrough by the president just to shake Joshua Singh's hand. Um, and President Bush came in and he went around the table and he shook everyone's hand, he got to me and he said, Hi, Dick, what do I call you? Uh, do I call you governor or ambassador? I said, Mr. President, do I call you governor or Mr. President? And he said, I'll call you, I'll call you <laughs> ambassador. Uh, and then he turned back to Joshua, having started with him and having shook his hand, he said, have you ever seen the Rose Garden? Joshua said, no. He said, come on, grabbed him by the arm and walked right back into the Oval Office and out to the Rose Garden. I grabbed my counterpart, the Indian ambassador, and Elisa Rice brought up the, 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 the rear. And we went into the Oval Office, and there's Je uh, Josh went. The president has his arm around him, pointing to the roses. And they walked back into the Oval Office. The president said, "Do you have some time? Sit down." Well, this wasn't supposed to happen. So we sat at that nice little seating arrangement in the Oval Office. The president's here. I'm here. My counterpart here, and Condoleezza Rice. And the president looks at Condoleezza, turns to Josh and said. Look at Condi, she's really worried because I don't have any talking points. <laughs> <laughs> I kid you not. I mean, it was, it was something. He said, you know, I, I just want to say to you, Mr. Foreign Minister, that I believe the relationship between the United States and India is absolutely critical. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna tell you the three, three reasons why. He said, in the first place, uh, you know, India is the world's largest democracy. And as the world's oldest democracy, we have a vested interest in, in, in their success. He said, in the second place, since the early 1990s, you, you've, you've opened up your economy and a, an economic relationship between our two countries is vitally important. And he's talking without talking points. And he said, and the third reason why is there's a, you know, I'm, I was governor of Texas. And in Austin and across Texas, there's a vibrant Indian American community, and they helped me in my campaign. Mm. He said, mm. so I, I just wanna say, I, I believe that uh, this relationship is a critically important relationship. And Jocelyn Singh's response is, Mr. President, the United States is the only superpower in the world today. There's enormous responsibility that is in, in, in your hands and the leadership of your country is vitally important for all of us. And the president said, well, there are a lot of people who envy that. You know, it's not easy. And um, he said, I mean, let me just give you an example. He said, for example, we're, we're in the process of trying to think through what do we do about this issue of missile defense and what it could mean for um, our 
country, but for other countries around the world. And, and the president, President Bush went on to describe a bit of that. When he finished, Jocelyn Singh said, you know, Mr. President, it's interesting that you raised that. Now these people are without any script. He said, you know, it's really interesting that you raised that. I just sent a working paper to the cabinet committee on security, saying that we should take a serious look at where this goes. So even at the beginning of April, the president on his mic, the foreign minister and his on their own, without notes, engaging on this. So I think, you know, where did it come from? It came from a, a deep sense of history and of India's place in the world. Um, and, uh, you know, I don't know enough about the leadership of the BJP today, about Narendra Modi and the people who will be around him on foreign affairs. I think it's interesting that in the manifesto there is so little about engaging with the rest of the world. Um, so I, I, I don't know whether that's still the spirit today, but it, w I, it was certainly the case. I mean, when, when uh, without prompting, uh, Prime Minister Vajpayee at the Asian Society used this phrase, natural allies. I mean, back home, people were saying, where'd that come from, right? I, I, I call this period from the nuclear doghouse to natural allies. <laughs> that's the, you can, <laughs> there it is. That's, that's a great response. It really is contrary to what I think most people's reaction is, which is, you know, it'll come when they feel that there's a weakness and they right. need partnership rather than strength, right. but uh, yeah. No. I think, let me just add very briefly, the, the timing was right. Um, Vajpayee, um, Jocelyn Singh, Mishra, were globalist in their thinking. Um, we'd gone through the period of a strange democracy, Dennis Cux's great title for his mm -hmm. book. Um, there was already a recognition that Clinton was reaching out. He had already met with uh, Gershwal uh, in New York in 97, where they both talked about missing opportunities and turning the relationship around. Mm -hmm. The timing was, was all right for this. And keep in mind that it was not only reaching out to, I mean, the Cold War is over, economic reforms kicking right. in, all of that coming together. Stars were moving into alignment. Uh, but keep in mind that it wasn't just the natural allies with the United States, and I was actually in New York for that speech. Um, there was also a move to, uh, toward establishing a more normal relationship with China. One little piece of that was Mishra himself took over the portfolio of talking to the Chinese about the border issue. They recognized they needed to um, move to a more normal relationship with the rising China as they saw themselves as the rising India. So these were the big power relationships. Interestingly, I'm gonna bring you back to the, to the document of the manifesto. Interestingly, in this manifesto, on page 40, the last page, uh, talking about the international orientation, it says, that instead of being led by big power interests, we will engage proactively on our own with countries and the neighborhood and beyond. There is neither the United States nor China are mentioned in this entire document. Not to say that they're gonna write them off, but I think that they're putting down a marker um, that a proud party with tradition, with confidence, is going to assert itself and not be led around not be a junior partner to anyone either in the region or beyond. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe I might just pick up on um, the second and third points of what George W. Bush uh, said as uh, Ambassador Celeste has indicated, the economic point and the Indian American point. I think they dovetail into the first point in terms of security. Uh, if you look at the economics of it, uh, the uh, Congress government really going back to Nehru, uh, looked to Soviet Union as an economic model as well as a, a, a political. Uh, that there was going, there are gonna be five year plans, the whole uh, top down of ministries, the license Raj. Uh, the BJP didn't have any stake uh, in that uh, approach to economics. Now it may have had its own protectionist problems but in terms of, uh, of having to look to something uh, that was a top-down socialist model, uh, the BJP, did, they didn't have to do that at all. And so who do you look to if you're not uh, looking uh, for that? You're looking for a more open model. You look to the United States. Uh, uh, 
Dick had previously mentioned Y2K. Well, Y2K just happened on that watch, but it was a tremendous driver in terms of the relationship between the United States because you had uh, thousands and thousands of people over here as well as in India who were making uh, their livings from a common uh, kind of uh, endeavor. Uh, if you look at um, the reaction in terms of uh, what happened uh, in December 13th, the 9-11 uh, of India, uh, you would have thought under almost any circumstances there's going to be war because of the zero tolerance you're talking about, zero uh, acceptance. But there wasn't. And one of the reasons uh, that there wasn't is because of really economic interests that were pointed out uh, to the India uh, and to the BJP government in terms of taking a, a more uh, reasoned and moderate approach to it. So uh, I think the second point, a lot of people look at uh, economics as sort of a make way. It's what you do after the guys with guns and bombs talk about all their great geopolitical uh, things, and then maybe you'll throw in the economics. I, I'd turn that on its head. I think that the economic foundation had a, had a lot to do with it. Now the third of President Bush's uh, points, it seems to me, uh, is also very strong. The Indian American community uh, had shown uh, in regard to uh, what happened after uh, the sanctions. Uh, uh, many of us here know uh, Swadesh Chatterjee, the people who were involved across the uh, spectrum in terms of making a real difference in what U.S. policy was. Uh, so that Indian American link, it seems to me, uh, was a, a, a very important uh, part in the uh, driving of the relationship as President Bush recognized. Okay, great. I would uh, just go back briefly to uh, uh, the Clinton administration because I think that President Clinton and of course his distinguished representative in New Delhi really played an incredible role in, in sort of setting the foundation, both his role in Cargill in, 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 in you know, pressuring Pakistan to withdraw and saving, in the, uh, by consequence, a lot of Indian lives in, that, in the battle in, uh, on the Cargill front, and his March 2000 trip to India. It, it's, um, we shouldn't forget that at that point, he was uh, the, by far, the, it was the high water mark of India-US relations since probably the Kennedy presidency, Jack and Jackie and their, and the impression they made throughout India. Bill Clinton, was received in a way that in both in the Lok Sabha and in the streets of Delhi, Hyderabad, and in Mumbai, that no president has been received before or since. And it became, it no longer was um, politically uh, problematic to be pro-American in, in India. And I think that helped a lot in the, in the coming, in the, in the later years. I just remember the scene in Hyderabad. Um, Thousands of school children lining the streets with American and Indian flags, and it was uh, it was quite a thing. Our but you know what was. happened when he when he first arrived? There was nobody. <laughs> yeah, the Indians, the Indian government had cleared everything back. All the streets were blocked off, and after about eight hours of this, he grabbed Vajpayee and said, "Mr. Prime Minister, I know there are a billion people in this country. <laughs> Where are they? I want to see them." <laughs> and so, by the time he got to uh, Hyderabad, they let the pizza come close. I mean, it was. Uh, well, let me open it up to the floor here. I know there, uh, there's probably uh, a few questions, so we got about 20 minutes to take uh, take a number of them, and uh, and and uh, uh, please keep them uh, short, concise, and we'll try to get you a good response. That's so, who we are. and ask, yeah. Yourself. Also, uh, let us know who you are. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much, Raghubir Gaur from India Globe and Asia today. Thanks for this panel. My quick question is that uh, Modi coming means tsunami for Pakistan. They have a campaign against Modi and BJP in Pakistan and also in India. What is the future of uh, India-USA because if they have a campaign against Modi? And finally, how m Mr. Modi will take uh, US-India relations because of visa? He had been denied visa. Everybody got visa in the US, but Mr. Modi for many occasions. Thank you. What was the first question? I, I missed part of that. Uh, Pakistan has a campaign against Mr. Modi. How are we 
in Pakistan and also in India because they think it's a tsunami coming if Modi comes in power. Thank you. Mm. Yeah. So I, I, you know, my feeling is almost everybody's had a visa problem with the United States. <laughs> his, his, his was a little more intentional. Uh, but when, when you become, when you become uh, the head of government, uh, you assume a new role. And I am sure that both our own government and his, should he become prime minister, will address that. And I, I happen to agree with uh, Rick and Firth. I think that if Mr. Modi becomes prime minister, he, in a way, is uniquely suited to actually make progress with Pakistan. Um, but I don't want to crown anyone the next prime minister of India. I'm more skeptical than everybody sitting here that how this election can turn out with, uh, with 80 million people who've never voted before and all the wonderful surprises that the people of India can work on us. Uh, let's not forget there are three very strong women who will have voices uh, that range from east to north, central to south in what the future looks like for India. Could I mention that um, on the visa thing, the U.S. was too slow to figure out how to deal with Mr. Modi. Um, just as I think that the U.S. made mistakes in how it dealt with the Cobra Gatti affair, I think on those two issues, uh, the best way for the two countries after the elections are over, new government, is say, let bygones be bygones. Don't try to relitigate either one of those um, mistakes on both sides. Um, including that of the U.S. Uh, on the question of Pakistan, I actually had dinner a few nights ago with a former finance minister of Pakistan. They are looking forward, if it is Mr. Modi, to dealing with him. I do not believe, and I've spoken to the ambassador here, Pakistani government has never suggested to me that they have reservations in terms of can we deal with this person, the history here. I think, again, um, I don't know anything about a campaign that you mentioned. But I, from those that I've spoken to, both in and out of government, I think that they will do what we will do in this country. We will deal with the, uh, the person and the government that is installed. I think the fact that uh, business, even through this period too, has maintained excellent relations with the state of Gujarat. Uh, so we, we've maintained a very strong bridge. It's mm -hmm. not the government bridge, it's not the State Department bridge, but there's been a very strong bridge. So that's, uh, that'll, uh, that'll, that'll make sure that it remains uh, even. And let me add on that, that there was a press report just in the past week, which I very much hope is true, that said that Modi had sent a team to Pakistan to sort of presage a possible Rodi, a Modi regime in India and to sort of establish relations. That would be a very smart thing to do, and I hope it's true. Yes. Uh, my name is uh, Abu Saleh Sharif. I work here in uh, uh, U.S. India Policy Institute. Uh, brilliant presentations. Uh, I'm a keen follower of uh, Indian uh, economy and polity. Uh, nostalgic. Uh, it was wonderful to see how you dealt with uh, Vajpayee Ji and uh, other ministers. Uh, but I tend to get an impression from your uh, presentations today that you tend to feel that the policy discourses in India and even written statements do not mean much you know, in a sense that you need to read between the lines. It is written in this manner here, but actually they don't mean that. Uh, that's a bit scary to me, it, because India does have a written policy statement and they tend to follow uh, the rules. Uh, however, assuming that we need to read between the lines, that does it really mean that Indian government, whichever comes to power next, is maneuverable? Does it mean that they will be more open to corruption? Uh, it's a very important thing because the UP government, if it loses, which is, it is on the corruption issue. Uh, the next one is, I'm afraid that I didn't hear much as to how the fringe uh, uh, nationalist parties who support uh, BJP is going to influence the future policy decisions. I think that's the most important discussion we need to have uh, because Modi doesn't have an experience of uh, being a central minister or 
um, uh, uh, being a prime minister himself before. Uh, so he was the chief minister, and now he'll be steered. The laggard like Adwani and Jaswan Singh is out. So who is going to uh, train them, so to speak, uh, to rule this country? Uh, 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 so the question is questions. the RAS. Corruption, corruption uh, and corruption uh, and and the last one is um, <laughs> the, the, and the last <laughs> one is the try. nuclear <laughs> issue. Mm. The nuclear issue. Uh, you missed to say that Dr. Manmohan Singh brought this nuclear deal treaty. Uh, is that not going to be taken forward? You know, because you're jumping from BJP time nuclear policy with this one. So you jump, but what about the continuity? Thank you. So corruption, uh, teaching ministers, nuclear policy. Great. Corruption, uh, anybody think that it'll be resolved by a change in, uh, in head of government? Uh, can't hurt. Can't hurt, can't hurt. <laughs> I mean, clearly there's, there's, there's two can't levels, hurt. of course, big corruption, and, and small corruption, um, and I assume that you're talking about the influence the central government could have on big corruption. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think you know Ray touched on that a little bit. Um, coalition allies, yeah, I, and depending I, on how. I'll uh, just uh, to uh, refresh your recollection. I, I talked about two instances from the past in which uh, coalition partners uh, acted as a constraint on the ability of the coalition leaders to be able to go forward. Uh, and that is certainly uh, true. Uh, I'm not sure who you're referring to exactly, although I can guess, uh, but uh, there will be a problem uh, with uh, coalition partners because they're gonna have claims uh, on particular ministries and the, the system of putting together uh, coalitions in India seems to be that whatever number of ministers I get, they're my ministers, they're not your ministers, Mr. Modi, if you're heading the government as a prime minister, and therefore I get to say whether they're gonna go forward or back or whether they're gonna do whatever that is. So that is a real problem. Um, uh, one hopes that, uh, but it's common to coalitions on both sides, uh, as we have seen with the present government, one hopes that uh, there will be a, a concerted effort, and this depends on how many seats in parliament you get, uh, to be able to uh, rein that in. You know, it's, if, I, mean, I, I think it's, it's very hard to say how people will behave when they move into government when we haven't seen them operate at this level before. And I was thinking earlier, Vajpayee, Jaiswant Singh, Advani, that generation, they were, they, there was a, a moment in time when they were all Congress wallows, you know? And then, and then the Congress party began to disintegrate and change. Um, so this new generation was born sort of post the dominant role of Congress. But there is a reality about the way India is governed, and that is at the highest level, among the, the, the dominant parties, there is an ongoing conversation about key issues. And those issues are discussed, and even though they can be debated and differences on the floor of parliament, that there is a tradition of briefing the leaders of the opposition around key decisions. And I, I will say, I mean, I listened to uh, I.K. Goudreau when he was still in government talking to Madeleine Albright, Secretary of State, defending India's nuclear uh, position. This is pre uh, the test, but saying he wasn't prepared to enter into any agree additional agreements at that point in time because he had a responsibility to defend his country. So and we may overdraw some of the differences between what a Congress-led coalition and what a BJP-led coalition will be like. The, the reality is the coalition dynamics are hard to predict, and the BJP paid a price for that when they first were elected, uh, and Jaila Lita pulled the plug on them, right? Um, now, the, what was the last question? The last question was, Nuclear policy. Nu uh, on, on the nuclear policy, well, that is, there has been continuity on nuclear policy, basically. I mean, you know, the, the negotiations that went on when uh, uh, President Bush 
and his team were working with the, with the BJP-led government, reached fruition under, under a Congress government. So I'm, I'm not sure. Now, the concern, as, as Rick pointed out, was whether Modi was signaling, uh, putting, declaring we, we no longer will be bound by a no first use commitment, right? That was a very worrisome issue, but apparently he it, has, he has said, said, he's already yeah. said publicly um, that he would continue to support that. So, you know. But there's also the question of the civilian nuclear uh, mm -hmm. policy. And that leads us to one of the great accomplishments was the civilian nuclear agreement, which is still stuck. Hopefully, whatever comes in is a new government. Hopefully, if it is the BJP government, they will look at what they have said in the past. They had some differing views when they were out of power, although Rajesh Mishra, to, um, I think to his credit, parted ways with the BJP in opposition, said, I support this agreement. Let's see what they do. But the fact is that this is a lingering, festering, unresolved issue for our business community and more broadly, you know, you put that much time and energy into something, fundamentally change the way we're dealing with each other on such an important issue, and then it just sits, what's gonna happen to it? Um, I hope that the new government will address that. Well, just let me uh, chime in on that a little bit uh, because I am very interested in it. Uh, it seems to me that on uh, time has moved on. In 2008, I was one of those who saying how many jobs are gonna be created in the US and so forth, and I'm very disappointed in what India has not done in terms of moving forward. I mean, we were the driving force. We got the, the two sites and then, uh, and then this uh, liability thing comes up. But uh, at this point, uh, we're now talking six years later, uh, we have to uh, move on in looking at energy policy between the United States and India rather than saying this has to happen or that has to happen. Uh, and we have to broaden that conversation from just saying, hey, you guys uh, didn't do what you're supposed to do on civil nuclear. We've got to look at solar, we've got to look at wind, we've got to look at gas, we've got to look at LNG shipments and, and, and have a broader view because we're at a dead end. And I can just, and I don't think it's telling any tales out of school, uh, but when uh, I was in Gujarat uh, in uh, uh, January of uh, uh, 2013, the question about nuclear policy came up in conversations with uh, uh, Minister Modi. And he said, look, <laughs> we've got problems, political problems with that here uh, in, in India. People don't want it. People say it's too expensive. Well, it's not that I'm against it, you understand, but I, we have these problems. And so the United States, it seems to me, has to be able to, to look at it more broadly in order to be able to address that civil nuclear issue. I think we have time for, uh, for one more, uh, Bob. We'll have uh, plenty of time if people are to stick Thank around you. for a quick reception afterwards. Thank you afterwards. very much. Great panel. Bob Bastine, Georgetown Center for Business and Public Policy. A really crisp question. Can we expect India's foreign po policies toward foreign economic policy, foreign trade, investment to change? As you know, they've been notoriously difficult in many contexts, most recently Bali Ministerial, but also in the Doha Round and, and other efforts to open up trade with, uh, with India. Policy. You should answer that one, Rick. <laughs> All problems will be resolved in two weeks. <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, I, I'm thinking about writing a, a, a column just specifically on this. So, um, you know, I, just just with the realization that voters are so uh, interested in economic policy, you know, every poll that's been done, that's the number one issue. Uh, when that first started to come out, and realizing whoever gets elected will be fully empowered to move on things. Um, so uh, on a personal in interest, uh, I actually put some part of my own personal retirement investments into an Indian exchange traded fund about three months ago, mm. and it's up about 40% uh, since then. So for my own personal interest, yes, <laughs> I think that it, it, it can't get worse, it's likely to get better. That's my personal, well, just very let me, personal. Let me, let me add to that. Uh, How about I, that? We're getting investment <laughs> advice here. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
<laughs> I think that we're going to have the same litany of uh, problems that we've had, and the only way to address it is not by a broad coalition that the Indians are all bad and we've got to, you've got to have this uh, complete change, but to take them as we have and try to work each of those problems. And I think in that regard, we are going to have a, uh, if it is a BJP-led government, a, how should I put it, a, um, a more business-like uh, approach to the problem. Uh, if you go to Gujarat and you have a problem, uh, whether it be uh, solar energy or whatever, uh, I can just tell you from personal experience, there's a night and day kind of uh, distinction in terms of how it's addressed. It is more business-like. I'm gonna do this, you're gonna do that, and this is the way this is, this is gonna work. Uh, and I have every hope that uh, some of that would be brought to a national level and help in the amelioration of kind of the problems that you deal with daily. Can I, can I just offer an observation? We're talking about what's happening at the Indian end and what a new government would mean. As, as someone who's been a very strong uh, supporter of President Obama, I, I have to confess that I'm disappointed that his um, leadership and his ability to um, move things forward has not been brought to bear more directly on our relationship with um, India. And I would hope that, uh, you know, he still has three years to go, and I would hope that he would use uh, some of his leadership as president uh, to help build this relationship, whomever the next government of India is. And it's important because of these uh, trade issues, which have been very much on his agenda, but he hasn't really focused on the India role there, and um, in so many other areas as well. So um, I, I, this is, it's gonna be very interesting to see what, what new leadership in Delhi's going to bring to the table, and then how we respond and how we reciprocate. We hadn't coordinated this, but could I just add yeah. a comment on what, what Dick just said? Um, in terms of, I expected a question on the U.S.-India relationship. Where is it? Where is it going? I read a great interview to sort of this bring the circle back. Professor Indifer. Great <laughs> interview uh, with Jaswant Singh recently. And he was asked the question, do you think India-US ties can go back to being normal, especially given, given the recent convulsions? We know what those convulsions have been. Here is his remark. He said, they are normal, but they are adrift. I think there can be a course correction. Nothing is so irretrievably wrong with them, but you do need an understanding and thinking and effort. And when I read that, I said, wait a minute, understanding thinking and effort was exactly, those were the key components of the nuclear dialogue. So I think that was true then. I think it's true now. We need understanding, thinking, and effort to get this relationship moving in the right direction again. Well, that's a pretty good uh, place to, uh, to wrap up. Um, you know, again, in two weeks from today, we will know who won how many seats, and hopefully within a couple of days after that, we'll know what a coalition looks like that will be running the government of India. I think we have a fair assessment about what a Congress government would look like since we've seen them for 10 years, and there will be some changes, but a lot of the same. But uh, hopefully, that's not a joke, that's real, but uh, uh, hopefully everybody here has a better appreciation uh, for what the BJP was, and maybe some insights as to what they could be. And I think, uh, I think most importantly, I think uh, what, what Ambassador Celeste has remarked that uh, Jaswan Singh comes and visits, uh, pulling him aside and allowing the courtesy of uh, the, pre the president allowing the courtesy of pulling him to the Rose Garden, having a personal conversation. Uh, I think no matter who wins the election, uh, hopefully we'll be able to afford those kind of courtesies um, because it's in those side conversations sometimes that the greatest things can happen between our two countries. So thanks all for showing up. And we're gonna have a short reception outside, so I hope you're able to join. Nice. Nice.